This video provides a brief introduction to the use of trace fossils in sedimentology. There's a whole other side to the study of trace fossils, or ichnology, that focuses on the biological aspects of the trace-making organisms, but we're not going to cover that here. So trace fossils, or ichnofossils, are tracks, trails, burrows, and borings formed by organisms, mostly animals, as they interact with the substrate. So a burrow is a structure formed in soft or firm sediment, whereas borings are excavated in hard rock or in, in shell, as in the case of this coral here. Unlike shells or bones, which are the actual remains of the organism, trace fossils are more of a record of the organism's behavior. They're given scientific names, but one type of burrow could be made by several different types of animals, and one type of animal also could produce different types of trace fossils depending on its behavior. Trace fossils are the interaction between the organism and the sediment. Sediment is also called substrate. As a result, the environmental distribution of trace fossils is influenced by things like energy level, substrate consistency. And so the types of trace fossils that you encounter in a section can provide clues to the original depositional environment. We've dealt with facies a lot in this class. I guess you could think of a face that we've been talking about as a lithophases or a rock facies. Um, so this a lithophases is a unit of rock that has characteristic combination of lithology, grain size, sedimentary structures, and, and so forth. By analogy, an ichnophases is a recurring assemblage of trace fossils. Certain trace fossils tend to occur together and tend to occur in specific environments. So an ichnophases, this group of trace fossils that tends to occur together, can be indicative of specific environmental conditions in terms of substrate or energy, for example. This diagram lists the common marine ichnophases and some of the characteristic trace fossils of each. I'm not going to go through all of the ichnophases and certainly not all the trace fossils either. Um, you've already heard about glossy fungites when we talked about estuaries and the transgressive ravinement surface. But I'll talk about a few of these starting with the Scolithos ichnophases. So ichnophases are named after one of the characteristic trace fossils that's found in the assemblage. The Scolithos ichnophases is characterized by vertical burrows, tubular or U-shaped burrows, like Scolithos in the bottom right here, which is just a simple vertical tube, or Diplocriterion, which is a U-shaped burrow that has features called sprita. So sprita are these faint lines that mark the position of the former burrow position as the organism grew, or as it adjusted its sediment position, or its position relative to the sediment surface. So in, the, in here, these faint U-shaped things are the sprita, the former position of this burrow. The Scolithos ichnophases is typically found in high energy areas with shifting, unstable, sandy substrates. So really in like beach or shore face environments is where it's very typical. So this trace fossil here, it's a vertical tube with a conical mud lining around it. It's called Rosilia. It can be found in the Scolithos ichnophases, but as well as in other environments too. Because the Scolithos ichnophases is found in these unstable, high-energy substrates, some burrows are lined with pellets, mucus-cemented pellets, essentially, for strength. So Ophiomorpha on the left here, it's a larger diameter, usually centimeter, couple centimeter diameter, vertical burrow. It sometimes has Y-shaped branching points, otherwise it's just a vertical large tube. It has, but it's really diagnostic having this characteristic pelleted wall uh, lining. So the photo on the right actually shows a modern crab burrow, the hole in the top, probably similar size to the, the fossil burrow on the left, and scattered around the beach are pellets being made to line the wall of the burrow. So note that ichnophases are not specifically depth dependent, as this diagram implies. The organisms don't know what the water depth is but they do know what the energy levels are and what the substrate conditions are like. And so because substrate and energy vary with depth, that means that ichnophases are somewhat depth related. So we'll talk about the Cruziana ichnophases now. Cruziana occurs in lower energy shelf environments like the offshore transition or the offshore. It contains a, a very diverse suite of burrows, but primarily horizontal burrows. Planolites on the left, this mass of tangled uh, lines, is a simple, unlined, unbranched, horizontal tube. It's one of the most common trace fossils. You see it all over the place. It's an extremely common burrow because of its simplicity, I would imagine. 
On the right, we have Cruziana, the name bearer of the Ichnophases. It's produced by trilobites or arthropods. It's a, a bilobed or two lobed furrow with sort of leg scratch marks. So we're looking at it from the underside here, and so this is where the trilobite or arthropod would have dug in as it moved along the sediment. Just to show you some other, a couple other sort of characteristic trace fossils. This U-shaped burrow here, it contains sprita. You can see the faint lines within the burrow. It's generally horizontal or slightly inclined. It's called rhizocorallium. It's also a very common burrow in the Cruziana ichnophases. And here's one called Tychicnus. It's a, an upward shifting horizontal tube. The tube contains sprita again. It's another common trace fossil in, in Cruziana. So the left photo shows a lengthwise section through the burrow, um, and on the right-hand photo, the yellow arrows point to specimens that I think are tychicnus, but this time we're looking at the, the end of the tube as it moves upwards. Moving further offshore, the Zuphycos ichnophases is said to occur in low-energy, deep-water settings, like on the continental slope. So not in a submarine fan setting, but just on the slope where sediment is accumulating gradually, not in, not in, not in episodic events. This Ichnophases doesn't have a huge amount of trace fossils in it, but it's really characterized by its namesake, Zuphycos, which is a very complicated and actually very strange tiered feeding burrow. So as I said, Zuphycos is a really strange burrow. It's very, I mean, it's large, very large, up to like meters in size. It's composed of a big central shaft and these large lobes that radiate out from that shaft in a corkscrew-like pattern. The lobes have sprites, so they make these large swirling patterns on, on horizontal surfaces. Here's another photo of Zuphycos in the Devonian of, of New York. In this case, the, these lobe-shaped sprite, what we're seeing of the sprite and not the actual edges of the lobe, it's constantly reworking itself, um, are, it's really, those, those, the sprite are, are very, very clear in this particular, these specimens here. So the final soft substrate ichnophases or marine ichnophases we'll cover here is, is called neurites ichnophases. It's typically found on the abyssal plain, the deep ocean, or submarine fans where there's intermittent turbidity current events. This ichnophases is characterized by highly organized and often really elegantly patterned horizontal grazing traces. They have these spiral patterns, these tightly meandering bands, and other extremely structured and extremely organized patterns. So I want to mention two other quite common trace fossils. Both of them have more widespread distribution and they're not really diagnostic of any particular ichnophases, uh, but you are likely to encounter them in the future if you end up looking at sedimentary rocks. So this fossil called chondrites is composed of small diameter tubes that repeatedly sort of probe outwards horizontally or diagonally from a central shaft. The complete burrow resembles, kind of resembles plant roots uh, but it's not plants, it's made by presumably a worm or some worm-like animal. Chondrites is common in low oxygen sediments, either in areas where the water itself has low oxygen, or just simply in deeper layers below the seafloor where there's less oxygen anyways. This is Thalassinoides. It's a, a large centimeter scale vertical burrow with Y-shaped branch junctions. It's also an extremely common and extremely widespread trace fossil found in a whole variety of Connell shelf environments and occasionally even in deep sea environments. So all these previous ichnophases in this video have responded to things like energy levels and substrate consistency and, and uh, among other factors. Um, but some ichnophases are more purely substrate controlled. They only occur on specific kinds of, of substrates. You already learned about the glossy fungites ichnophases, which forms on firm, which are soft but not lithified substrates. There's one called the teridolites ichnophases, which forms in wood. So I won't say any more about that in the video here. But I will talk a little bit about the tripanites ichnophases, which forms on hard lithified substrates, so basically rocks or shells, perhaps. So here's an example of Trypanides ichnophases formed on something called a hard ground, so that's a lithified um, rock surface, in this case when the ocean transgressed over an eroded limestone surface. So that surface was lithified and therefore hard, and the small circular holes kind of in the area sh where the red arrow is pointing um, are tubular borings belonging to the trace fossil Trypanides.
So the types of trace fossils are certainly good environmental indicators, but even just looking at the simple abundance or density of burrows can actually be very useful too. So bioturbation is a word that's used to refer to the process of biological sediment mixing, and its intensity can tell you things about environmental stress or sedimentation rate. So these diagrams here show schematic sediment layers. The white and black are just different layers of sediment. Um, and they are, for example, completely disrupted and mixed and churned up by bioturbation in the bottom image. And at the top image, number one, they're completely unbioturbated. The layers are just perfectly like they were deposited in the first place. Environmental stress, like low oxygen levels or fluctuating or low salinity, will tend to exclude a lot of burrowing organisms from the area. It's just too stressful. They just can't live there, or can't, many of them can't live there. Um, and so what this means is that there's going to be low levels of bioturbation, perhaps. On the other hand, high sedimentation rate will also tend to reduce the intensity or the amount of bioturbation, just because the animals simply don't have time to mix the sediment thoroughly before more sediment gets deposited on top of them. So, for example, you know, mudstones formed in an estuary where salinity might be low or variable could have less bioturbation than offshore mudstones would. And as you learned previously, the pro-delta environment is characterized typically by high sedimentation rates, so you could expect, maybe on average, less bioturbation there in an offshore mudstone. So bioturbation and the ichnophases can be very useful for distinguishing these sort of ambiguous lithophases that could form in a variety of environments. Bioturbation intensity is measured by this sort of semi-quantitative score called an ichnofabric index. And it's just a simple numerical scale from 1 to 5, where 1 means no burrowing and 5 means complete mixing, and 2, 3, and 4 are just sort of intermediate categories, as shown by these diagrams here. So the categorization is definitely somewhat subjective. Now the photo here shows a Cambrian limestone with an ichnofabric index of 3 or 4, so just by visual comparison to the diagrams on the left. And here are some Permian silicoclastics in the coastal environment. The lower layers, like the bottom there, you can see lots of primary laminations that are not disrupted, but there's a couple burrows. So it's probably Ignofabric Index 2. Um, you know, the primary laminations are visible and only disrupted a little bit. But the uppermost layer is completely homogenized. There are some visible burrows, but just everywhere behind it is swirly and all mixed up. So this is probably an Ignofabric Index of 5. 